Okay, great. Can you see the slide now? Yes, I can. Okay, wonderful. Uh, well, I mean, before Mimi and I start, uh, I, I want to issue a caveat here to all of you. I'm joining you all from all the way from a small Tibetan refugee in southern India. And so usually the internet is not really that good. But today, since this morning, we have been having a thunderstorm. So, uh, so far, I've, I see that the internet connection has been fairly good. But every time I pull up the uh, slides, it gets a little irritating. But now, once we already have the slides pulled up, uh, I'm hoping that uh, we won't have any issues. So, uh, but in case if my voice, uh, voice break down, uh, the audio is not so good. Please bear with, uh, bear with us or bear with me. <laughs> and I hope that we'll be able to get through this an hour without much of an issue. So uh, again, uh, thank you, Molly, really for helping us uh, in so many ways and, and making this possible. Uh, thank you, Mary Jo, for a very kind introduction of Mim and me. Uh, last month on, on April 14th, Mim and I, uh, had a wonderful time uh, talking about how, in order to live a joyful, joyful life, how we need to create a healthier mind. And so uh, for this particular session, Mim and I will be talking about how we can create a healthier body to live joyfully, right? And so we all have, I believe that we all have this common understanding, especially uh, being in this community, uh, the, the the intimate or in, in or intricate relationship in our mind and body and here even though we'll be talking about how we can create a healthier body to live joyfully we would certainly be touching on uh, creating a healthier mind or how they're related to our creating creation of a healthier body so the the first slide here mim and i wanted to share this quote uh, from one of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's recent teachings. It's about, we have been inundated by so many difficult things that we have been seeing in this past decade and more so in this past two or three years, of course, due to pandemic. And then we have the climate change issues that has started to become more and more evident. And then this past few months, uh, due to some very obvious reason of our uh, human greed and, and anger, we are seeing things in part of a world like in Ukraine, the situation has been extremely challenging. And then this past month or so, we are seeing very difficult things in Sri Lanka, right? And so whether uh, in, from this part of the world or in part of uh, Europe or even in the United States with the COVID now kind of a coming, uh, sort of a, uh, coming back, we really have to see how we can be in a best position to investigate the situation because that's really important for us to know how we can actually grapple with the difficult situation. And one of the things that Mim and I have always uh, engaged in conversation is about how, first of all, we need to be in a state of calmness, state of peaceful environment, thereby engaging and investigating, investigating a situation, investigating the problem in hand that we can deal with situation without really getting into being too anxious or emotional. And so what we have here, what His Holiness have said, uh, we quote here, while facing favor, uh, unfavorable circumstances, the most important thing is to keep calm because only then we can employ the quality of investigation without emotion or anxiety. So this really to kind of, um, all of us in so many ways, we are aware of this, but really to reaffirm and kind of uh, bring it closer to our, uh, our uh, home, how we can actually engage in conversation, engage in thought process to navigate ourselves when we are in the midst of all these difficult and challenging situations. And of course, we all have potential to do that. And uh, as you all can see here, the fully bloomed hibiscus flower there you see, it's from Mim's uh, living room. 
and which I have seen for all these years. And I think we look at plants sometimes quite often we, we, we use flowers like lotus, the way we actually it grows from mud and how it transcends that particular environment where it's very muddy, but then the transcends and bloom uh, to kind of a, uh, aesthetic, aesthetic, both aesthetically and kind of uh, giving us that metaphor of how something can come out of uh, a environment which might not be a most ideal situation to have a beautiful, aesthetic, aesthetically beautiful uh, flower. And so uh, when we see the fully, fully bloomed hibiscus here, we all know that how we actually can germinate from a seed to a blossoming flower and then can fully bloom. And we all have that potential as a human being because in Tibetan culture, Tibetan Buddhism, or most of the ancient traditional thoughts there's a saying that human life is one of the most important lives as that we can see in the in in uh, in our environment in our on our planet because it has the potential to engage in a conversation engage in action that can really help us not only to thrive but also to flourish so that kind of uh, having that understanding let's just take a minute to understand uh, what is Tibetan medicine because all the content that Nim and I try to bring into our work, into our research, into our teaching and more so for our today's class is really uh, gleaned or extracted from the ancient uh, traditional Tibetan medicine or Sova Rigpa. So Sova Rigpa, what is Tibetan medicine? What is Sova Rigpa? So Sova Rigpa is a Tibetan name uh, and uh, it's, it's an ancient or traditional medical system, yet it's really timely. It's very relatable in today's, in dealing with today's uh, health, not only health issue, but today's uh, global problem. And Sova Rigpa itself means literally in Tibetan, it's a science or knowledge of healing uh, from Tibet. So we call it Tibetan Sova Rigpa. One of the things that uh, we, we all, I mean, again, to reiterate, we all being in this particular collective space, we all know that the pur what is the purpose of our life, right? And if we kind of uh, use the lens of Tibetan medicine, if you will, or Tibetan Buddhism, uh, the purpose of life is to be happy, right? And in order to be happy, we need to really embrace uh, uh, the sense of well-being, both mentally and physically. And we all know that uh, being able to uh, acquire that well-being is a lifelong process, not only of kind of uh, taking care of our diet and behavior, but it's a lifelong process of living in harmony with ourselves, right, and with others, and most importantly, with our planet. And so we all have to bring that together. And that's at the very much or kind of a macro level. But if you bring down to the micro level, then we are talking about our environment, right? And then the relationship that is based on the interrelationship, which is uh, uh, myself and, and the others in my environment, as well as the interrelationship, that, which is uh, a relationship with myself, with me and myself, right? So that's the important thing. And if we look, if, if we try to engage more in what had happened in all those, because Tibetan medicine, for instance, just like Chinese medicine or, or, or Indian Ayurvedic medicine or Yunani medicine or Siddha medicine, or you know, in that respect, uh, homeopathy uh, uh, medical system or naturopathy. So in Tibetan medicine, uh, the Tibetan medical doctors have always engaged in in conducting research in their own ways. And now in current time, the scientific researchers, uh, both the, the Tibetan doctors as well as non-Tibetan doctors who have invested their time and academic resources as well as intellectual resources in conducting research on Tibetan medicine. And there are many studies out there that have reported a positive results or outcomes uh, when they have use Tibetan medicine uh, as an intervention or as a medium of generating or developing research questions and developing hypotheses. Uh, 
So uh, with that in, in, as a kind of a preamble, agenda for our today's talk is the first thing is really, uh, I touched upon that a little bit earlier, how we can live in harmony with your or our inborn constitution. And so we'll talk a little bit more about what is our inborn constitution, right? And the second thing is we'll talk a little bit about uh, how we can actually identify our own constitutional nature, right? And so uh, uh, Mim and I, with our colleagues, have uh, conducted and published a study on developing a self-assessment tool based on Tibetan medicine. And that will lead to the lifestyle guidelines tool and after that, we'll talk a little bit about how we can recognize how, why it is important to recognize our suffering and how we can do that. And both at the macro and micro level, we'll talk a little bit about that. And by recognizing our suffering, only then we'll, we will be in a better position. We will, be, uh, we will have the resources to transform our suffering uh, into joyful living. And from here, I will uh, hand over our virtual mic to uh, Mim or Dr. Cameron, please. Thank you, Tenzin. Okay, I'm gonna talk about how we're constructed, and why we need to live in harmony with our constitution. Tibetan medicine long before quantum physics in the US or in the West taught that everything, all phenomena are made of energy. And this energy has five characteristics. The word that's translated from Tibetan is called elements, but that's not really a good translation. It's more, these are characteristics of energy. So one characteristic, uh, the Tibetan is called earth. That's the characteristic of stability and structure. I'm sitting here on my desk chair, not falling off because I have stability and structure. The second characteristic is water. Uh, moisture in my body, the blood circulates, my lymph circulates. Without water, I would not survive. Fire, this is the uh, er energy of heat, and it causes growth, development, food absorption. Without that energy, we could not function properly. The next one is called air. This is the characteristic of the energy that gives us the ability to move. So I can move, my heart pumps blood, I can speak, and so on. And then finally, space allows the other elements to interact and coexist. Each of us is, it consists of the same five elements of energy. Therefore, all of us are connected just like waves in the ocean. And we need to understand ourselves down to the level of our energies. You know, Plato said, you should know thyself. Well, this is on a very deep level. We not only need to know what's in the mind, we need to know what's going on with our energies. Okay, next. Now, the five elements or five characteristics of energy interact to form three primary energies that are essential for life. Each of us has these three energies. One is lung. This is the energy consisting of air, the air element. This gives us the ability to move. It's called vata in Ayurveda. Tiba is the energy of heat, of fire. And uh, heat energy is called yang in Chinese and pitta in Ayurveda. Bacon is water and earth energies. This is cold energy. It's called yin in Chinese and kapha in Ayurveda. Each of us has a unique combination of these three energies, which is called our constitution. We are born with this, just like we're born with certain DNA. Okay, next. So the, the three energies, form seven different constitutions, and here they are. These are general constitutions, and each one of us has one of these constitutions. So one of them is a Lung constitution. This is where movement energy dominates teep and bacon, and this uh, our creative people in the world tend to have a lot of Lung. 
uh, our artists and writers and musicians. TIPA, somebody with a lot of TIPA, if, if that dominates their constitution, they tend to be athletic, they tend to um, be hot-headed, uh, they get things done, they set goals and get things done. But if they get too hot, they run over other people and cause lots of problems. Our leaders tend to have a lot of hot energy, TIPA energy. Bacon is cold energy. This dominates lung and TIPA and somebody with a bacon constitution tends to be kindly uh, and calm, but can uh, procrastinate, not get things done, put on weight. Now, many people have a dual constitution and that's TIPA lung or lung TIPA. So the movement and hot energy dominate their constitution. That means they have the characteristics of TIPA and lung. Other people have a bacon lung, lung bacon constitution. This is where cold and movement energies dominate TIPA. Then there's TIPA bacon and bacon TIPA. That's a combination of hot and cold energies and that dominates lung. And I've had many Tibetan medicine consultations, many of them with Tenzin. And Tenzin says, I have a TIPA bacon, bacon TIPA constitution, which makes sense to me. So on one hand, I have the drive to get things done, the drive to get my PhD and so on, set goals and meet them. But I also have a lot of bacon energy. And so that gives me a calm mind, but I have to be careful. Otherwise I can be too sedentary and not, and not be active enough. Then finally, the ideal constitution is an equal amount of each of the three energies, <clears throat> lung, teep, and bacon. But this is a very rare constitution because it's hard to keep three energies in balance. So only very highly evolved people are born with these three. But what's wonderful, when I finally figured out my constitution, now I know who I am. And I can, it, it gives me a freedom to live in life. Oh, this is who I am. And this, my students say that to me all the time. Oh, this is why I behave like I do. And it gives us an understanding and, and it gives us compassion for ourselves. Now I realize why I do this and, and, it, and we love ourselves more as a result. Now Tibetan medicine describes the intricate relationship between mind, mind body and environment and multiple factors promote health and disease. So, Let's go over some of them. Our thoughts, and we talked about that in the first webinar, and you can see the uh, video of that, that things start in the mind first. Let's say I'm angry. I'm angry about what happened in Buffalo, you know, the uh, killings in Buffalo. <clears throat> well, my body's gonna get hot. Uh, uh, if, I, if I continue to be angry for a long time, I can develop inflammatory problems. Uh, I'm not going to make good choices when I'm influenced by this anger. So that is one of the factors. Another one is behavior. You know, if I'm behaving in ways that sabotage myself, that's going to affect my health. Genes, my genes. I, I'm a Scandinavian background, Swedish and Norwegian. So I bring that into the mix. My diet. Um, you know, and all of us know we are what we eat. And, uh, and so we need to be thoughtful. We need to be mindful about what we're eating. The or nurturing that we get uh, during pregnancy and in early life through all our life, that affects us. Our culture, what does our culture value? Does our culture value drinking to excess? Um, drinking to get drunk? Uh, so there are many factors involving culture. The weather, <clears throat> we in Minnesota know how the weather affects us. The winter, cold, then we get cold. The hot summers, we get hot. So we need to adjust to the weather. Toxins, and uh, this is about climate change, so many other things that we are affected by all these toxins in the environment. And, and that affects our health and disease. What kind of work we do, 
you know, I'm a nurse, and so many nurses now are getting injured on the job, uh, and uh, and it causes many nurses to leave because of that. Our slides just left. Tenzin, are you still there? I think he must have got booted off, Mim. Okay, I will. I will um, share my slides. Okay. Oh, you back, Tenzin? Okay, what of the slides? Can you show the slides? Sorry about this. Okay, there it is. <clears throat> um, other people can affect us. Uh, and other, other people affect us. If we're angry at the people we're involved with, that's going to make a big difference in our health and disease. Then uh, is this a pleasing environment? I want to show you, Tenzin gave me a plant to, his plant to nurture while he was gone in India. And if you see it behind me, it's blooming today. It loves this environment. It's in that south, south window. But I have a Christmas cactus up in the sunroom. And that I used to have in this room. It didn't like it. But up in the sunroom, it's, begot, it's become huge. And I just had to trim it. So our environment, some of us do well in one environment, but not in another. Then finally, our planet, what is going on with our planet. Next. <clears throat> OK, so health and happiness equals balance. Disease and suffering equals imbalance. We need to reverse the imbalance. We need to be mindful. What is out of balance? Reverse it and correct the underlying imbalance. So Tenzin and I developed the Constitutional Self-Assessment Tool, CSAT, and Lifestyle Guidelines Tool. And we uh, put together a research team to study them. So um, Mike, the Tenzin is going to explain how to use them. These are free. We can do them online. Otherwise, in our book that was just published, they are in chapter two of the book. And if you go to the website for the webinars, click the link to the book, and you can get a 30% discount from the publishing company in honor of these webinars. Okay, next. So Tenson's going to explain how to use the CSAT and the LGT. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, again, uh, apologies again for uh, getting cut, cut out and having this disruption due to in internet connection or from here. So uh, I'll talk a bit about the uh, how to use the constitutional self-assessment tool. Basically, the, the intention here is to identify uh, a self. Uh, but again, uh, I think it's important for all of us here to get that understanding that especially from coming from a space where we, especially in Tibetan Buddhism, Tibetan medicine, there's always an emphasis on whether the self really exists or not, right? And most of you must be thinking, okay, if in certain culture, like in Tibetan Buddhism, if we engage in this constant uh, dialogue about if there's really self or not, how we're going to do that, why it's important to identify self. Uh, I usually, when I, when I talk, engage in conversation or debate with people, uh, uh, especially focus on this particular subject is uh, when we talk about self, we sometimes we can think about uh, the, the S with the capital letter self, big, uh, big S self and the small S self. So we're here, what we are looking at is again, the small S self really, really kind of are getting down to the basic understanding of an individual, right? And so what we have, uh, the, uh, the assessment tool that we have on the back and center's website on the University of Minnesota page is, uh, we, you will find the 47 different items, right? And those items uh, range from a very basic kind of a physiological uh, uh, presentation or anatomy to our individual nature uh, and how we actually perceive or conceive a certain things. Uh, 
So if you all can see here, some of the items that uh, is displayed on this slide is really very much focused on our, phys uh, our, our uh, uh, phenotype, which is our uh, physical presentations. So it, uh, we see here from our height to weight, to kind of our frame, body frame, to our skin, and then kind of a skin, how, what kind of a skin that we have. And so the whole idea is really about if we want to take care of ourselves, you want if you want to create a healthier body or healthy body, it is pertinent that we need to understand our body itself a little better. And so here, when we talk about identifying our constitutional nature, we are very not only looking at our physiological body, but we're also looking at our emotional body or our emotional state of being, right? And by doing so, the, the thing is, it, give, it gives us that vantage point, uh, if you will, or it gives us that, uh, that object of investigating, the object of working on, the object of making that kind of a small shift, small changes, right? And so once you get that, and as uh, most of you might have already done that, but if any one of you haven't done it, if you, get, if you go on the website, if you look at that particular uh, assessment tool, and it's pretty uh, uh, user friendly, easy to use, right on the website, you can check uh, those boxes that, that relates most closely to you. And so when you see any of those options under the Lung, Tipo, or Paykin, uh, what is the best way to do it is look at what is there that you see in yourself, not what you want to see in yourself. So which is really important thing. So that's how, and once you get down to the end, to the 47th item, and you will get a certain percentage, right? And so most of the time, it's always a door. Uh, it, it's it's, it's uh, quite rare to have a solitary or a single uh, 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 primary energy nature. Or more rare is, as Mim alluded to earlier, is to have the whole combination of three principal energies. And so most of the time it will be a dual. And so for instance, if uh, Mim was earlier talking about her dual constitution of Tipa Pekin, so if you're looking at, for instance, uh, somewhere around 40% of Tipa, uh, 20 to 30 some percent of Pekin, and then some percent of Lung, we would get a sense that we're looking at the dominant of uh, Tipa and then combination of Pekin and then a little bit of Lung. So because since we all have five elements that Mim presented earlier, there's certainly, a, uh, it's a case here that we will have all the three prim primary energies because the Lung Tipa Pekin is very much based on our five elements. And then once we identify our constitutional nature, then we need to look at how I actually want to not only maintain our health, right, and to kind of uh, uh, to keep, to keep that sustainable, to be to to have that uh, opportunity to have a sustainable health and well-being, but also to to prevent any kind of a potential uh, health issues, right? And so, for instance, if I end up with let's say having a dominant type of nature, uh, because at that particular moment, even if I have a dual nature, if my dominant nature is tipa, then I'm gonna follow the tipa column here. It's not only to kind of uh, maintain the balance of tipa, but also to make sure that if my tipa has aggravated or elevated a little bit, how I can bring it down to, to the state of, uh, uh, not the exact balance, but in the most possible way of keeping ourselves not only physically healthy and, and, and uh, maintaining their well-being, but also mentally uh, more healthy, more attentive, more focused, and having a, great, uh, more, a greater opportunity to be, to be kinder and more compassionate and be more, more uh, considerate of everyone in our environment. And so that's really a kind of a, uh, the essence of how one can actually uh, identify oneself using the self assessment tool based on Tibetan medicine, the study that Mim and our colleagues and I published, uh, published and have it on the Black and Center's website. And that's a really key thing. And once you have that 
understanding and then we can look and go into the lifestyle guidelines that we'll see on the slides here. But again, uh, due to the interest of time, we won't really dwell too much into that. But if there's any questions or any, any uh, doubts or comments, please feel free to put it on chat or, or ask us uh, during our Q&A session. And uh, please, Min. Okay. <clears throat> My students ask all the time about both tools, CSAT and LGT. We were born with a particular percentage. So I'm guessing that I, I was born with a constitution of 40%, uh, about 40% TIPA, about 40% bacon, 20% lung. So I need to keep my current level of energies at those percentages. For example, if it's real hot outside, then my TIPA is likely to go up. So I take off some clothes, I drink some cold water to get it back down because if my TIPA goes up, it's gonna affect the other two energies because altogether they're a hundred percent. So that's why uh, we can use the, um, lifestyle guidelines to keep our constitution in balance, our current energies in balance with our constitution, but also uh, to, if, if something's out of balance, then as T Tenzin said, say my TIPA is up, I can use the TIPA column to bring my TIPA back down so it's healthy for me. Okay, now let's talk about suffering. <clears throat> Tibetan medicine uh, distinguishes between pain and suffering. Pain is if I uh, you know, fall down and break my arm, I'm gonna have pain. Suffering is how do I interpret this? So if I say, oh, why do these bad things all happen to me all the time? You know, How am I gonna manage to do my work with a broken arm? So that adds suffering. We do not need to suffer. That's what Tibetan medicine says. Suffering makes things worse. And, and then it has a terrible effect on the body. So much of the illnesses that we have are actually from suffering. And we can, we can decrease the suffering. So life consists of suffering, Tibetan medicine teaches. <clears throat> and in Sanskrit, the word is dukkha. It's suffering or dissatisfaction, not being satisfied with life, going around saying, oh, why can't I have this and this, you know, not being happy with life. And there's natural suffering in birth and baby cries. When there's change, there's constant change, impermanence. The mental poisons that we talked about last time, and I'll talk a little bit about sickness, aging, and then our biggest suffering is about death, our mortality. We are afraid of dying. And uh, our uh, webinar three will address that. Suffering is caused by ignorance about how to be happy. So we think that we'll be happy by doing something that actually sabotages us. So we need to be, develop mindfulness. So we keep the focus on how can I be happy and not get diverted by other things. Liberation from suffering is possible. Next. To become free from suffering, we need to live an ethical, compassionate, wise life. And we'll try to explain a little bit about that. Okay, um, lung energy is, is connected with greed, attachment, desire. That's a mental poison, uh, the first category of mental poisons. So if I, I'm dissatisfied and I'm going around saying, why can't I have this, why can't I have that? <coughs> Excuse me. That's going to increase my lung energy. I'm going to be more nervous. And we can sort of feel it. It's feeling like this inside. And the psychological impact is anxiety, lack of focus. Um, but this also leads to health problems. If we go through life with these kind of characteristics, we're going to end up with health problems. And the first one probably is insomnia headaches, irritable digestion bowel movements, heart and blood pressure issues, dry skin, movement disorders, addictions, mental health problems. So you can sort of tell what your constitution is 
by looking at how often you get these kind of characteristics. When you get sick, is this what you get? Then that means you have a lot of lung in your constitution. Next. Next slide. Then this is next one, Tipa. Oh, here, sorry, sorry. <clears throat> and uh, the second category of mental poisons is anger, hostility, aggression. This promotes Tipa imbalance, heat imbalance, and it leads to anger. People who are angry are hot. You can see it in their face. They are more likely to develop inflammatory disease. And one of the doctors are saying now that one of the big issues for chronic illness is inflammation. People are too angry. They're going around angry. They're hot instead of calm. So by behaving in this way, we develop skin rashes, inflammations, infections, headaches, autoimmune disorders, sensitive small intestine, cardiovascular disease, and hormonal issues. We don't have time to talk about these in detail. Okay, next. Then the third category of mental of um, suffering is, or the third category of mental poisons that cause suffering is confusion, illusion, and closed mindedness. This promotes bacon imbalance, cold imbalance. You know, we just can hardly move. The psychological impact is withdrawal. And then we develop these health problems, respiratory disorders weak metabolism, poor blood circulation, kidney and bladder dysfunction, obesity, diabetes, and dementia. So again, look at when you are upset, when you're sick, you get these kinds of um, illness, illnesses. Okay, next. Tansen's gonna talk about how we can transform this suffering into joyful living. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so one of the things that I think I talked a little bit about in order to live joyfully, how important it is to create a healthier body. In order to do that, how important it is to know our body a little better. And so during our last webinar, we talked about how we can create a healthy mind, right? Uh, the important thing here for, here for us to understand here is, is transforming suffering into joyful living we need to cater to both our mind and body, right? And I also talked a little bit about understanding or identifying our own nature, thereby knowing our body a little better, not only at the physical level, but its impact on our mind or our emotion, right? And so the constitutional self-assessment tool is really when we, not only about understanding our constitution or understanding our inherent nature, but also to kind of, uh, to, to, to be synced with the ebbs and flows of our body, both at the physical and the mental level. And in, in order to do that, the one thing really we need to get, uh, get control of is our, our lifestyles and our dietary habits, right? And so that's one, what, what we try to do here is really to kind of uh, have, a, uh, have some kind of a tech home message where we can use a specific lifestyle guidelines tool based on which we can create or craft an individualized needs, individualized uh, dietary or lifestyle guidance for ourselves. And so earlier, Mim alluded to about how we have a different percentage of our nature, right? And once we have that understanding, it really kind of, uh, it might not give us that, that kind of a silver bullet to correct everything, but at least it gives us that kind of a certain level of confidence and control over how we can, how we can not only uh, engage in, in behavior and action to keep our constitutional nature balanced, but also work in preventing any kind of potential illnesses down the road. And so once we have the primary nurtures, the percentage of your three primary nurtures, they're about the same as the percentage in your own constitution. So this, this wording might sound a little tricky here, but the really the, the main thing here is really, if I know that I'm tipa in nature, I want to make sure that my tipa 
doesn't really go too high above the percentage of what my body should be, or it doesn't really go too low. Okay, um, I will take over at this point until Tenson comes back. Um, here, let me get to the slides. And so that is the whole goal to keep the current percentages of the of uh, I'll just read the slides because um, the computer problems are taking up a lot of time. Um, then what we want to do in transforming suffering into joyful living is we want to calm one, and that's the lifestyle guidelines. Uh, uh, tool shows us how to do that. We want to cool tipa. We want to warm bacon. And then uh, uh, we want to address our unique mental, physical, and spiritual needs on personal, community, national, and planetary levels. Create a healthier mind and body that empowers us to live joyfully and do our part to heal our planet. Um, let's go to the next slide. Tenzin, can you go to the next slide? Sure. Okay, and, and go to the one about happiness. Go to the next one. Okay, and we, we're running out of time, so we'll just let people read this. These are the characteristics <laughs> of happiness. You want to say something about that and then we'll go on to the end no i think it's good i, I mean, kind of we touch upon that and uh we all know what are the some of the key components of uh transforming suffering into joyful living we can go to the next slide please min okay so we talked about how to live in harmony with your inborn constitution do the constitutional self-assessment tool and lifestyle style guidelines tool. As Molly pointed out in chat, you can get the link to those uh, up from the website where you registered, with the webinar website. Also, they are in chapter two of the book. And, uh, and then we talked about recognize suffering, then transform suffering into joyful living. So uh, it's, meditation is an essential part of Tibetan medicine. So let's take like a minute to meditate. This can help us to uh, 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 practice what we've just learned. This is loving kindness meditation. And compassion, if, you're, if you put Tibetan medicine in one word, it would be compassion. There's a ton of research coming out about the importance of compassion a self-compassion, compassion for others, compassion for all beings. And loving kindness meditation can help us to do that. So why don't we set, put, put your feet on the floor, hands in your lap, close your eyes and breathe in a circular manner. Breathe through your nostrils, from your abdomen, slowly, deeply, evenly, with the in-breath the same length as the out-breath and no break in between. This is the way we need to breathe all the time because when we breathe in this way, our body, each cell in the body can let go of toxins and we can bring in life force, energy. We are made of life force, prana. We want to bring in as much as possible. So may all beings be well. May all beings be happy. May all beings be peaceful. May all beings be loved. Now you can open your eyes and on your own, you can do this loving kindness meditation every morning when you get up, set your intention. This is how you're gonna live your life and your life will be transformed. Then finally, let's go to the last slide. So we leave some time for uh, questions. Uh, here is the link. And when Molly sends this out, you can click this. This is the link and that's the link where you can find the 
linked to uh, the CSET and the LGT. And then these are the books, the book that Tennyson and I just published uh, that has all this uh, content, you can get that. And there's a 30% discount right now on it offered by the publishing company. Then here are two courses about Tibetan medicine. Uh, and this fall, I'll be teaching this one online starting on September 6th. And if you click the link, you can find out how to find <laughs> more information. And then finally, for students who take this course, they can take the India course. It, right, we, right now it's on hold because of COVID, but we hope that students can go to India next, next year. Okay, thank you. And um, let's have some questions and answers. Hmm. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, Mim and Tenzin. And I have to say, I'm so impressed at how you role modeled calmness of mind um, <laughs> during such a Zoom um, difficulties. And so um, really grateful for that and appreciate you being here. I'm going to just launch in because there's many questions. We won't get to all of them. But somebody writes, many of these physical characteristics listed on the C <laughs> CSAP <clears throat> change with age. So how does a person's constitution change with age, or does it? It doesn't, but yes. Uh, um, Tenzin, are you still here, or are you frozen? Okay. Uh, the constitution stays the same. Oh, there you go, Tenzin. Do you want to answer go this ahead. question? Please go ahead, ma'am. Yeah, if we need it, it I can answer. Yeah, our constitution stays the same, but our energies, are, the current percentages of our energies change. For example, when somebody is young, their bacon energy is, is uh, higher from age about birth to 20, because we need to build bones in, in the body. Then between age 20 and maybe age 70, TIPA is higher because people need a lot of energy in order uh, to deal with life. Then starting about age 70, uh, Lung goes up. Uh, so that one becomes lighter, and then we are able to let go and die when it's time for us to die. Thank you for that. So somebody else writes, can I understand that these constitutions <clears throat> we are born with as a result of karma in existing and past lives? And how does this relate to impermanence and interdependency? Go ahead, Tenzin. Yeah, Th thank you, uh to Mary Jo, as well as the person who asked this question. This is really important question. And uh, just to kind of uh, give a few uh, very succinct response to this question, in both in Tibetan Buddhism, Tantric texts, as well as in Tibetan medicine, uh, there's a strong emphasis on three key uh, components of conceiving for mothers. Uh, of course, the healthy, mother, healthy mother's ovum or egg, uh, further semen, and then the, uh, the, uh, the impact of subtle consciousness from the past life. And so there's a continuation of information that passes through the consciousness. So that's really the three key things. So, so situations where sometimes both the parents have no health issues, but still would have difficulties in conceiving for mothers. So that's the one thing. The other thing is, really the important thing is about and how that can actually be impacted by the karma or the cause and effect uh, because the uh, the components or the factors that comes from the parents mother and father plays a huge role and as well as the continuation of their consciousness brings lots of imprints of things from our past life and then that's the cause and effect and then the, the the things that we talked before in terms of uh, growing and sickness and aging and then eventually a death very much represents or illustrates the concept of impermanence. So Tenzin, building on that answer, somebody else writes that they were a very happy, healthy person until they came down with bipolar disorder. And, you know, she writes, um, I, it sounds like almost like Tibetan medicine is blaming the victim. For me, mental illness came out of nowhere. I was not anxious or unhappy, closed-minded or greedy. My illness is chemical and genetic. Mm. This, this is, yeah, this is such a great question. And, I, and I, it's really, I think the for us, I think one of the uh, kind of uh, the common theme that we try to 
uh, highlight in this particular presentation uh, not only for Mim and I, but also for all of us in this common space is really to understand that uh, our, we as a, as a uh, uh, human uh, living being, uh, we have, there are certain things that work for our body, right? As, as long as they're in this, they are performing uh, function in a sustainable and, and, and in a, in a uh, equilibrium manner, especially coming from Tibetan medicine. But the moment it gets distracted, moment it gets disrupted due to external factors or internal factors as well, then that very, uh, then that very form our body, which really sustain and, and works for our well-being, really uh, then start to act differently. And then it causes all the health problems, uh, both the physical and mental issues. And therefore, putting some time and energy in identifying our constitutional nature uh, is a, it's such a big and important thing here because, and only then we understand that, okay, I have this propensity to be more anxious, or I have this propensity to be a little more depressive in nature, or a little bit more, more kind of, a, uh, uh, how do you say, aggressive in nature. And therefore, I need to constantly watch over myself, uh, not having someone watch over my shoulder, but watching myself over myself. And I think so. those are the things that we constantly have to grapple with. And I think the question that uh, which uh, was just asked, I think it's really kind of a point toward how it's important that we understand both the potential at, as well as the, the risks of what it could lead to when it's not really in the state of the right uh, balance or right health. All right. Well, thank you for that answer, Tenzin. You know, there are so many questions. I'm really sorry that we couldn't get to, you know, more of the questions today, this time today, as it before went so quickly. Wanna, first of all, thank you, Tenzin and Mim for being with us today. Um, I also want to acknowledge and thank all of the staff at the Bakken Center who helped make today's webinar possible. We hope that you'll join us for part three of our Tibetan medicine webinar series on May 26th, when we'll be joined by um, Minga Rinpoche. More information about the webinar series and the center's yoga and Tibetan medicine program will be included in the post webinar email. So watch for that. Um, thank you so much, all of you for being with us today. You know, it was really an international audience in addition to Having people from across the United States, we are also joined today by people from Portugal, Ireland, Turkey, Mexico, Nepal, um, and Canada. We will be sending out a link to resources following today's webinar. Thank you all so much for joining us. Be well. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye.